All right, so welcome to another episode of the Rediscovery Channel, where Ivor and myself, Stilger, we talk about a different topic each week. And this week, it's actually my turn. And Ivor, I'm curious if you know anything about this. Uh, probably know something, but have you ever heard of the Welt Eislehre? The what? The Welt Eislehre. And that's a German word. It's a German mythology. And it uh, it goes back to the occult roots in uh, Nazi ideology. No, I, I it doesn't sound familiar to me. Um, but maybe when you talk more about it, I might recognize something. Okay, yeah. So let's um, let's talk a little bit more about the occult within Nazi um, ideology because there's actually a lot there. And my, my story this week starts um, in 1945 when American paratroopers, they took possession of a town called Berchtesgaden in South Bavaria. And uh, in a discovered and abandoned, uh, uh, they made a discovery in an un abandoned salt mine. Uh, and actually they found here Adolf Hitler's library, which was taken from his nearby home in the Alps, the Berghof. Um, and I'm a strong believer that what you read, what kind of content you consume, it probably says a lot about, uh, to the minimum, about what your interests are. So then the question is, what kind of books do you think they found in his library? What kind of topics did they cover? And of course, I already gave a little bit away because I said it was going to be about the occult. So yeah. I know that, uh, Hitler, um... I think he was he was a fan of uh, Wagner. I'm like 90% sure of that. Maybe you found out something about that, but he liked Wagner. And um, well, I like this, Wagner too. That's uh... well, yeah, that doesn't make uh, okay. Hitler also drank water, so I'm not saying it's like, <laughs> yeah. not drinking water, but like uh, um, the swastika. I, he he did, he looked at I know he looked at all the Germanic legends and stuff, but he also looked at uh, Iran a little bit because um, supposedly that's where he got the swastika from. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk I a little think, bit more about that. Yeah. Okay, the Mithra, a Mithra cult. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me let me let, let me uh, continue with my story because I think uh, you 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 got a couple points there, but um, I think I'll clarify them as we move along. Um, so the majority of the books that they found in this abandoned salt mine were actually in the esoteric domain. Am I pronouncing that correctly, by the way? I'm just as a question. I always say esoteric. Esoteric. They might say okay. esoteric in England. They sometimes say okay. it over there. Okay. Esoteric probably is better. Okay. So they were about topics like natural remedies, vegetarianism, alternative diets, German mythology and runes. And in one, yeah. All those things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, all right, uh, I'll just go to you. So, uh, actually, in one of his uh, books, they found a surprising amount of notes um, or underlining. Well, I don't like vegetarian. I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so this was probably his favorite or one of his favorite books because it had so many underlinings on it. Um, and it was a book from 1923 about magic uh, written by Ernst Schertel. And the author talks in his book about how humanity needs to rediscover its magical powers that went missing because of modern science. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it also talks about how not a single perception can be described as completely true or untrue. And that through the power of our imagination, we can become masters of the world. Opposed to being a slave to some un untouchable empirical truth. Hmm. Interesting, right? Sounds like postmodernism, actually. Uh, it does, yes. <laughs> so... Um, now, why I want to talk about this topic is because sometimes the Nazis are described as Christian or Christian inspired. And the, the reasoning behind this, because most of the Nazis were Christians, then by default, the Nazi, Nazism is a Christian ideology, right? 
question mark. Uh, no, wrong. Because you could say the same thing about communism, because the majority of communists were also Christians. So does that mean that communism is also a Christian ideology? I would say no. And, uh, you know, most people know that Marx, Lenin, um, and other quote unquote great thinkers of socialism, they were fanatic in their hatred of religion in general. Um, and specifically when it came to Christianity. Yeah. So, yeah. And even though both ideologies are presented as complete opposites today, uh, which they're not, they actually have a lot in common. Yes. Uh, one times is sometimes presented as an outcome of Christianity, whereas the other, other one is not, which it doesn't make sense. Um, but, you know, I think that you know, it, rather than trying to make connections there, I think it makes more sense to just look at the ideology itself. Um, you know, what was Hitler reading? Uh, what were the top Nazis reading? What were they interested in? Um, and when you closely examine the tenets and beliefs of the most radical followers, you find that they were inspired in many cases by the occults, by paganism and by, wait for it, what do you think is the last one? Evolution. Socialism. <laughs> oh, well, so that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, socialism was actually really important to them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, later, uh, because there was one part of the Nazi party, the Sturmabteilung, and they got kind of frustrated because they felt that socialism wasn't being implemented fast enough. Um, but what I want to talk about first is um, the mythical island Thule. So it's T-H-U-L-E. I always pronounce that Thule. Fool. Okay, you I'm not sure like, uh, how to pronounce it. So uh, you speak German. I do so. speak German, and but then again, it's you know, it's it's a name. It doesn't. I don't think it has meaning, well, as what, far as I know. But it, the language will have rules, right? So how would you pronounce it, in according to the German rules? Probably Tula. Yeah. That's probably correct. Yeah. By okay. the way, everybody, uh, Stilgar, he speaks three languages, going on four. Yeah, and English is not his first language. It's Dutch. It so. is, yes, yeah. So I, that's maybe a reason why I um sometimes a little bit, but then again, I also do that in Dutch. So. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> yeah. well, I do. It, but yeah, I, I, I tried. We, we try not to. So we're we're still learning, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there this mythical island, which is somewhere in the northern ice um, sea, was part of the um, ideology of Nazism, right? And um, it was a direct result of Romanticism as well, which we talked about um, before about the French Revolution and the war in the Vendée, um, how this Romanticism was kind of a secular religion that was a driving force. Um, moving and influencing things like communism as well as Nazism. Um, now, if you look at romantic ideas of the time, like returning back to nature, living in, in harmony with Mother Earth, uh, being able to shape reality by sheer willpower. Uh, these are not just ideas of the modern Green Party here in the Netherlands, uh, or maybe the new left coming out of American universities. They are also ideas that were the driving force behind National Socialism under Hitler Germany. So uh, about this island, right, um, somewhere in the frozen north, it's not Otto Holland um, from Frozen, uh, it's different, <laughs> but they believe that this magical island was the origin of the, the German people, right? Um, it was the lost city of Atlantis. And there were some fears that somehow aliens were involved as well. And there was this Austrian engineer called Hans Hörbiger, and he later came with this uh, Welt Eisleere. And according to this theory, the Arctic region was hit by either a meteorite made out of ice or even an ice moon, which contained the life force um, of the first people. And of course, I mean a specific kind of people. Um, and they came to life, and then on Tula, they built this highly advanced civilization. And now, uh, you know, of course, even the Prose Edda, 
uh, when it talks about Thor and the gods, they were just talking about these extremely sophisticated people, which, by the way, also had supernatural powers. Uh, but then a second ice moon hit and the inhabitants had to flee to places like the Alps and the Himalaya because the tidal wave flooded the entire world. And then they met the lesser people, right? Um, so that's how the, the theology goes of Nazism. Um, and then here, you could then, according to the dogma, find remnants of the original culture with Tibetan monks, Indian gurus, and Japanese samurai. Hmm. This is why there was also a strong interest in topics like yoga, astrology, magical runes, and Germanic heathen, heathen rituals. It is also where the interest in their most beloved symbol comes from. And you mentioned this one before, the swastika, oh, because That's it can be again. found in uh, Eastern temples, but apparently there are also European artifacts that have it as well. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll include some pictures, although I'm not sure By the way, <laughs> about that. Into, you're going to yeah. see swastikas everywhere, like all over the place. Of course, they don't mean it to be like a, a racial thing. Like no. over there, it's it's like uh, to make something auspicious to give good fortune. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, uh, Hitler, uh, he did have some Indian regiments that worked for him, but he actually had contempt for Indians. He thought they were uh, inferior, but he still took their help, you know, when it came mm. to the fight. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But, you know, if, if I describe this mythology about the origins of people, um, it doesn't exactly sound like uh, the book of Genesis to me. Oh, no. Um, no, it sounds like something completely different. Um, it sounds distinctly pre-Christian or even anti-Christian. Um, and I want to go a little bit more about this. Uh, there was this Tula Foundation. I might be butchering that. Sorry about that. Somebody please correct me in the comments. But uh, one of the, the founding members also started the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the DAP, which later became the NSDAP, um, which is the party of the working class. And other two lists were Alfred Rosenberg, Hans Frank, and Rudolf Hess. So some pretty big, big names there. Yeah, Rosenberg, a Jewish name? No, Very I don't Jewish. think so. No, I, th I think a lot of Jewish uh, people took on German names. So that's that. Why it might be why, but I, I, I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like yeah, so Jewish. Hitler himself was also a believer in this origin. In this origin story, as he wrote, we are the Prometheus of mankind from which the spark of divine genius shines forever. And I translated that from German, so I may have butchered that. Um, he also supported an observatory in Linz, uh, the city of Linz, which was to support uh, the great three cosmologists of all time. According to Hitler, they were Ptolemyus, um, Copernicus and Herbiger, which was the, the founder of the Welteislehre. And he also gave uh, Herbiger an honorary title and supported him financially. Hmm. Um, now, there was also the SS, right, and under Heinrich Himmler, and who also helped many esoterics. Um, he was active in the Artaman movement that wanted to start German settlements in Eastern Europe that would live according to ancient pagan ways in harmony with nature's <laughs> seasons and the cosmos. Yeah, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, actually, uh, maybe I, I, I bet they were all vegan, well, <laughs> what they ate. I've but, run yeah. into a bunch of people on the internet that, you know, anonymous people in a certain anonymous, usually in an anonymous forum where they call themselves like neo-pagans. And they say stuff like uh, Christianity is a Jewish deception. We should return to the religion of our ancestors. And Thor was a symbol of strength and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, OK, who convinced you that Thor is real? And they always leave after that. They're, they're, they like call you like a Christ cuck and everything. And, and then they'll say that you should get back to the religion of your ancestors. I'm like, but nobody really believes in those gods anymore. Like they're usually I call them lar pagans because uh well, that's, but that's exactly my point. And, yeah, and I think in, in a lot of these Nazi 
uh, places you all they also have people like oh you're following a, a Jewish God you know like that proves exactly what I'm talking about here like the the Nazi ideology there was a lot of pagan and occult um, parts of it and and that was what the foundation was of it really where what it been, went came down to and I'll talk more about that later but people they talk about you know they think about the occult and the Nazis and they think UFOs and uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark and they think it's you know it's a joke but it's not it's actually true there were all these people at the time you know and you say okay well these people don't believe in Tor but um, these people took this really seriously that they really took it as like a part of their their new way of life um so actually let me, let me continue um a little bit so yeah. the um the the artemans they wanted to focus on um so biodynamic farming without the use of fertilizer and pesticides and they would only plant and harvest when the stars were favorable so they had like um, all these, they believe there were all these healing herbs in, in nature. And they also had these anthroposophy practitioners, uh, which is a philosophy founded by Rudolf Steiner, uh, who was also an expert in the occult. Um, and, you know, uh, during, like in Dachau, Auschwitz and Ravensbrück in the concentration camp, they would have people actually like prisoners um, working on the gardens to plant all these different special plants, like under the supervision of these anthroposophy, um, yeah, anthroposophen. I'm, I'm not sure how you would say that in English. Um, but the SS even had a division that did research on witches. And uh, Himmler was convinced that the Christian church was persecuting women in the past that were actually upholding ancient Indo Germanic traditions. They probably, and, well, Okay. <laughs> and because of this, he believed the church had sinned against the German people. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, Himmler wanted to get rid of the church after the war, after the Nazis were done with the church, with the Jews. He thought that the Christian ideals of right and wrong and an afterlife were harmful to the en energy of the Germanic people. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also thought that Christian compassion compassion was in the way of his ideals of ruling other peoples and that's also something that hitler agreed with and hitler had much more admiration for other religions like islam buddhism hinduism and shintoism i don't think he liked hinduism um i, I mean like he never had anything good to say about uh india so uh, you might want to check that okay. although uh there are people in India today that are fans of Hitler that see him as like an ally and think it's not many, you know, that's not the general sentiment, but there's a few people that are like that um, because they saw him as a way to get rid of the English. It's kind of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. Yeah, well, for, for Hitler, it was that these religions were more open to war and um, he saw you know he didn't like how violence was being seen as sinful yeah um and he also liked gods being a force of destruction as well as creation so anyway i'm not going to put any value statement on that it's just you know like people paint him out to be like a devout catholic <laughs> i don't know if people do that but nothing could be further from the truth um yeah. the, the only reason he, he played along was like he wanted to be more careful than Himmler because he he knew that he needed to take advantage of the German people, uh, which were still mostly Christian. And he was just hoping that Christianity under the National Socialist Party would die a slow death. Um, and he was also supportive of trying to change Christianity. Um, so at one point they tried to found their own church where Jesus was somehow Aryan <laughs> and they equated his death to the death of Odin. Uh, which there are some similarities there, actually. Um, but yeah. then the, the Nazis, they started, so they started their own Lutheran church movement with its own bishop and everything. Uh, but the German Lutherans resisted, and of course the Catholics, by default, remained loyal to Rome instead. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you you want to say something? or? Yeah, I... 
I read about 20% of Mein Kampf. I've never quite finished. It's a huge book. But he does uh, talk about his views on uh, Christianity. And um, he talks about the Catholic churches and the Protestant churches. And one complaint he had is that um, is like is like Slavic uh, pastors being uh, over a German congregation and that they were allowed to celebrate their own culture, but Germans weren't. And mm. he said that like the church, you know, the church shouldn't get in the way. I mean, I, I don't want to say something wrong, but it's been a while since I read, but basically the, the church had to support the nation, not the other way around. Yeah. So he wanted to be kind of subordinate to the people group. Yeah, yeah, and actually um, there is a Polish saint that I wanted to include, and I, maybe I can say, tell a little bit about him now. Um, it was um, the Polish priest Maximilian Kolb, and um, he died in Auschwitz, and um, almost a fifth of all the, the Polish uh, priests were killed, most of them in concentration camps, because the church was heavily persecuted uh, by the Nazis. Um, and this guy, he took the place when some people uh, escaped from the um, uh, concentration camp. They were really pissed and they were gonna take 10 people and starve them to death. And one of them's like, oh, I have a wife and kids. And this priest took his place instead. And he was the last one to survive. And they were like, he was like, like singing and like worshiping uh, Jesus the whole way. Um, and like there was like other prisoners participating in it. Um, and then in the end, they had to actually um, execute him by lethal injection. Um, and apparently when he, uh, at the end, he held up his arm for the injection. Um, and it was uh, like even the executioner had a hard time. So... Um, so yeah, and he was made a saint, and his statue is carved over the door of London's Westminster Abbey. So I'll uh, include some uh, that image in the in there as well. So yeah, let's uh, let's go back to so one more uh, Goebbels, who was in charge of propaganda. Uh, he uh, himself employed paranormal individuals as well. Uh, but he also tried to keep the NSDAP isolated from unclear mythological ideas because he was afraid of alienating the German people. So he had to appease German um, conservative Germans. Um, and Hitler himself claimed that national socialism was based on scientific knowledge of racial, social and natural laws. But in re reality, he and the Nazis were really just, you know, all into this crazy strange esoteric and uh, pagan and anti-Christian uh, ideologies. Um, and a good example of the true ideolo ideological background is shown through the Night of the Long Knives. Have you heard of that before? I have. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll just tell the audience and maybe you can compound on it or add to it. But um, so in 1934, Hitler killed, some say, uh, up to 1,000 people of the uh, Sturmabteilung, the SA, um, in part because they feared the influence of the leader, uh, Ernst Röhm, who was a homosexual, by the way. Um, and, and they also implicated that the SA was full of all these illeg illegitimate practices. And, and that's because... So there was a cultural battle going on because these were like the original, the SA were the original brown shirts. Uh, they were the guys that would go up in the street and uh, beat up political opponents. Um, and they were growing impatient, impatient because they wanted to see what I mentioned before, that the socialist agenda was further realized. And they also had radical is, um, esoteric beliefs um, and at their core, these people were anti-traditionalists. So, yeah, basically in this one night, um, Hitler took out Ernst Röhm and some of the other um, people within the SA because, yes, he feared them uh, because of their power and because they were extremely popular among common people. 
but also because he was there were conservative people within um germany that you know they were saying like what's going on over there like these these people are crazy um and that's also a reason why he get real had to get rid of them apparently or that's why he did it anyway um <clears throat> but yeah did i leave anything out or anything no actually you you know more about it than i did i just understood it as like um when hit like uh the night that hitler obliterated a lot of political opponents like that's all that i really know about it is that he yeah, people they were actually his like his strongest supporters for the longest time, um, and then all of a sudden they were no longer needed, or they became too dangerous. Yeah. But these were they, these guys were like the backbone, like the people in the street, you know, wearing the brown shirts, uh, you know, beating up the political opponents, um, and they had these very strong anti-traditionalist and socialist ideals, and I think that pretty much rounds up. I think if you're looking at the backbone of national socialism and its ideology, this is it. Uh, this is where they were. And, you know, you can't just say, okay, well, um, the, you know, because uh, Germans were mostly Christians, that means not sh national socialism is a Christian ideology. It makes zero sense. Um, I'm not Sure, the yeah. Germans were even mostly Christian by that time period. I think uh, during World War One, they were they were mostly like agnostics or atheists. They might be Christian on paper, but they didn't have they didn't have Christian beliefs. They that was like one of the most godless countries in Europe. One of the no, it's a, it's a it was a postmodern movement. Yeah, um, it, and it, it's and, and there were all these romantic ideas and. And of course, like, uh, you know, I mentioned the brown shirts and nowadays you have black shirts on the street and that are also furthering socialism and uh, anti-traditional ideas. Um, and those two are usually, you know, they say, well, these are complete different, completely different, but actually they have a lot in common. Um, and I just want to clear a little bit more about there's there's a lot of occult stuff going on within this ideology. It's it's clearly pagan, um, it's modern, you know, or postmodern, and it's all about you know breaking down the church and breaking down. That was in the end the idea was to break down the church after they were done with the war, and breaking down everything in the name of the state. Yeah, um, it was a uh, it was a collectivist ideology. But it was also an an exclusive ideology. So that's the difference. You know, the that's, biggest difference that's between the biggest that difference. And communism yeah. Yeah. is communism. They try to force everybody inside. Whereas uh, with the Nazi ideology, it was only for their people. But they were going to move uh, or obliterate other people that were in their way. And you know, you mentioned the brown shirts and their methodology and how they were against um, uh, tradition. You know, in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, you had these young people that went all around smashing up uh, statues and Buddhist temples and churches and uh, dragging out college professors and humiliating them in the streets. They're called the Red Guards. And uh, the Red Guards, they were um, they were waging war against something called the Four Olds. That's what they called it. So the Four Olds were old ideas, old culture, old habits, old customs. And this is when like a lot of the traditional Chinese culture was uh, obliterated or permanently damaged, you know? So, so things that were from antiquity or which had been around for a long time, also uh, religion, you know, they would, they, they, they would attack all those things. So like historical monuments, artifacts, religious uh, buildings, these things were all targets. Um, yeah. And they would uh, they would also use a lot of shaming language and and uh, try to ostracize people. They also killed people. And then the thing is, whenever Mao, whenever these red guards had served their purpose and Mao no longer found them useful, they were all assigned to forced labor in the countryside. Not all, so it's but most. Basically, the same thing because probably yeah. because then became a threat. Um, and well, they outlived their usefulness, and it was time to stop because he achieved his goals, and uh, you know they weren't given 
I, I, I don't know if they were given the chance to stop or, or the orders to stop. They were just like, now we're sending you to the countryside to learn from the peasant class or something. So, which really meant just like forced labor on the farm. So, yeah, I do see some difference because the Nazis had this romanticized idea about the old days before Christianity arrived and they had this this whole mythology and sometimes there were aliens involved as well where you know they were like from Atlantis that was actually German people and they were going to go back to it and using all kinds of magical power um, but there was a lot of post yeah postmodernism where you 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 dream up this this ideal society um, where actually the reality of life it's or reality itself doesn't matter because you can bend it with your will or with magic or whatever um but there were all these occult influences uh that were driving the, the nazi ideology which i find i find that very interesting yeah the feeling i get is that the nazis they wanted to be their own masters and be the judge of what's right and wrong because like the ancient Germans, they really did believe that Thor and Odin was real. And, you know, they believed in uh, Midgard and uh, 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 what's that? The serpent called the world serpent. Yeah, not, what, that, you know, uh, Yggdrasil. Yeah. No, Yggdrasil the tree. There's the okay. world serpent that goes around Jormungandr. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they really believed in all that stuff. But the Nazis, it was more like... Uh, picking and choosing what uh, they're going to believe. And you have like the, the uh, they call themselves neo-pagans today. I call them lar-pagans. They, but they're, they're like, oh, we like what Odin represents. We, we worship what Odin represents. We don't really think he's real. We just like what he represents. Okay, then you're an atheist. Just say that. But uh, they, well, I mean, they N- don't. Nietzsche had a big impression on uh, national socialism as well, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and and to some extent so did Darwin because it, oh, it, yeah. it's just survival of the fittest but then you instead of looking at you know uh, individuals or or species of different bird species you start dividing up peoples and they said well only one species is going to survive then we got to better make sure it's the German people so um, yeah they also would I mean, if evolution is true, and a lot of people don't like to hear this, but if it is true, then all the different races must represent different levels of development because it, because like everything that exists is a product of developing upwards from uh, bacteria. And they, they hate it when I say this and, you know, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but that is true. And the Nazis believed that and the Japanese also believed that. They were the, you know, the most superior race in the East. So, and actually, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting how um, they worked together. You know, they, they did find like uh, some common bond with each other. I actually think that Germans and Japanese have a similar work ethic. Well, there's, there is, there are strong ties, I think, between Germany and Japan. Um, when they started modernizing, they, uh, they sent a lot of people to Germany to see, to learn from, uh, from Germany because the Germany had a lot of industry already. And they were also enamored, I think, by Prussia, um, which was, of course, expanding exponentially. You have to respect the Germans for being so innovative and like efficient even though they did cause a lot of destruction and not just with, well, World and, War and II, but with what other thing they had in, in common was the fear of the uh, communists because uh, Japan was scared of uh, the, the Russians and uh, so was Germany. And that was actually one reason I think that Japan never invaded the Soviet Union was because they were too scared to poke the bear. Well, they should have been too scared to poke the United States. <laughs> yeah, although some people say that um, the real reason that they surrendered was because uh, the Soviet Union was about to declare war on them. So, Well, actually, um, after we dropped the second bomb on them, we, we cut a deal like, uh, with them that we would not prosecute or execute the emperor. Like we, we agreed to leave the emperor alone. And after that, they surrendered. It was a, so it was actually a conditional surrender. Hmm. 
So the okay. emperor, he probably actually was a war criminal. I mean, I think uh, Hirohito was the main mastermind on, uh, when it, not Hirohito, Hirohito was the emperor. Hold on. The, what's that guy's name? Hideki Tojo. Hideki Tojo was the main mastermind, but uh, Hirohito was, was not clean. I mean, he, he was in on that stuff, but as a condition of their surrender. They also thought that we had a third bomb to drop on them that was ready to go, which uh, wasn't actually the case. Hmm. So it would have been like a nasty war. Like if we had to put ground troops uh, into Japan, they, the thinking was that there would be like suicide attacks and, uh, you know, uh, it would have taken, it would have been costly to defeat them because even the women and the old people and the children would have attacked. At least that was the thought at the day. Yeah, and probably there, it would have been a lot easier for the Russians to do it because they could have, they were much closer. And they actually boarded them. Yeah, the Russians took Sakhalin from them after. And yeah, and they probably could have taken all of Japan. And that's sure. probably what they didn't want either. So, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. But I, I know very little about Japanese history, but that's I think that's also the point of this whole channel is, right, that we rediscover history together. So maybe that's a good one for, uh, for another topic. Yeah, there was a Japanese guy I was talking to um, online, and he told me that, before World War II, when the Japanese soldiers were, you know, they were in Manchuria, they actually kind of helped spread uh, communism into China because they wanted to uh, they wanted to make China weaker so that they wouldn't, you know, like a divided, divided and weaker. Divide and conquer kind of thing, which is yeah. what the Germans also did to Russia. Yeah, when the Germans sent, did that uh, Russia. When they sent Lenin back with a train full of supplies, but yeah. All right, man. But I think we're going to go into a whole different topic here. <laughs> yeah. But I, I um, yeah, I, I think it was a good topic. Um, I hope you you learned something. Uh, you probably already knew quite a few things. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think it was, um, I enjoyed reading more about this. And I knew a little bit about the occult, but a lot of it had to do also with, you know, pop culture and UFOs and Did uh, you read about the Lebensborns. The which? Sorry, the what? The Lebensborn. I might be pronouncing it wrong. Lebensborn, where they tried to like uh, I can't remember. Like they uh, they tried to get the women. It was either they tried to get them pregnant, or they they tried to have them give birth uh, in a cemetery. Like they would because they thought that the spirits of the ancestors would lend strength to the new baby. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that Laban's born. Okay. That was part of the thing the Nazis were doing. I can't remember if it was conceiving Is it like the Laban's, child. like living? L-A-B, I think it's L-A-B-E-N-S. Okay, I don't know. Laban's yeah. born. Wait, yeah. Uh, L-B-E-N. L-A-B-E-N-S. I don't know, man. It's, it's okay. a German word. I should have taken German in high school instead of... Uh, Spanish. I think it would have stuck with me, but um, <laughs> yeah, like you they, can use it in parts of the U.S. Oh, you know, unlike Spanish, which nobody uses over there. But uh, hey, <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 that's an interesting point. But I think there is a lot of stuff, uh, cold stuff, we could probably bring up. Maybe if we can ask some of our viewers if you know anything, just drop it in the comments. Um, if you have a like. Uh, give it to us, please. We enjoy it. Uh, we're just doing this for fun. Uh, we're not making any money out, out of this. We put quite a lot of work into putting those um, talks together. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, uh, BitChutes, and on, I think, most of the um, podcast players, if we're I'm not mistaken. Rumble, but we haven't updated it in a while. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you gotta yeah. Let me know if you're uh, missing any, uh, also any podcast players where we're not live. I can, I can add it. But um, yeah, if you, if you want to just drop any comments on maybe a topic you would like us to discuss, um, look forward to hearing about it. And other than that, I think this is a good, uh, good episode and we should close it off. Yep. That's good, man. That was a good uh, topic. And it also will lead to some other things that I wanted to discuss too. Cool.